Aujourd'hui, je suis très heureuse de vous accueillir pour ce dialogue. Merci à Jérémy pour ces points pratiques qu'il a évoqués. N'hésitez pas à le contacter dans le chat si vous avez des problèmes. Je m'appelle Émilie Pollack, je suis chercheuse à l'Institut international pour l'environnement et le développement et je vous souhaite à tous la bienvenue à cette conversation sur l'investissement et le changement climatique lors de la semaine d'action climatique de Londres. Dans le cadre de nos discussions aujourd'hui, nous allons parler de la gouvernance de l'investissement dans le contexte du changement climatique et l'action climatique. Et notamment, nous allons parler des investissements fonciers ou des investissements ayant une empreinte foncière importante. Nous pensons que nous pouvons avancer par rapport à nos ambitions climatiques via des lois, des politiques et des stratégies. Mais si les investissements d'une grande échelle ne sont pas contrôlés, examinés euh, du point de vue climatique, nous allons avoir du mal à réaliser nos objectifs nationaux et internationaux. Nous allons aujourd'hui évoquer les questions d'atténuation et d'adaptation. Nous allons parler des stratégies et nous allons parler notamment des dimensions de gouvernance qui sont nécessaires. Nous allons entendre parler des leviers euh, légaux et politiques et nous, euh, qui ne sont peut-être pas suffisamment évoqués dans le cadre des discussions sur les pratiques d'investissement. Cette réunion a été convoquée dans le cadre de l'initiative Align. Il s'agit d'un consortium rassemblant l'IED, le Centre de Colombie d'investissement, avec un financement de la part de, du gouvernement britannique UK. AID. Nous avons plusieurs euh, intervenants dans le cadre de notre table ronde aujourd'hui. Nous avons Grace Brennan, qui est associée au Centre de Columbia sur les investissements durables. Nous avons Isaac Kilwapoua, qui est directeur exécutif dans le Centre de politique et, et commercial et développement de Zambie. Lorenzo Cotula, qui est chercheur en chef à l'IED au Royaume-Uni. Nous avons Olivier, directrice chez Climate Legal, un cabinet de conseil juridique basé en Afrique du Sud qui conseille euh, les, le secteur privé sur la gouvernance et la législation climatique. Nous avons également le docteur Yele Egena Anabo euh, qui vient de GIZ et l'autorité de la protection environnementale en Éthiopie. Sans plus tarder, nous allons tout de suite nous lancer dans le vif du sujet pour essayer d'évoquer tous les sujets importants. J'espère que nous aurons le temps de prévoir quelques questions à la fin de notre table ronde. N'hésitez pas donc à utiliser la fonction Q&A pour poser des questions que vous avez aux intervenants. Grace, nous allons commencer en vous posant une question. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer ce que nous voulons dire quand nous parlons de, des investissements alignés sur les ambitions climatiques Quelles sont les réponses auxquelles nous avons besoin de réponses Quelles sont les données nécessaires au niveau d'un projet pour savoir si un projet est aligné sur les ambitions climatiques Merci, Émilie. Merci à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureuse d'être parmi vous. Quand nous parlons des investissements alliés sur les ambitions climatiques, nous parlons des investissements qui soutiennent une voie scientifique permettant de, de réaliser des objectifs d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre afin de limiter l'augmentation de la température mondiale à 1,5 degré. Les pays peuvent déterminer si un investissement est aligné sur les ambitions climatiques en évaluant la manière dont ces les investissements euh, avancent les objectifs du pays tels que euh, mentionnés dans les contributions déterminées au niveau national. Plus spécifiquement, on peut se poser la question de savoir si l'investissement porte certains risques climatiques et, ou a certains impacts climatiques pour savoir si l'investissement contribue au changement climatique via les émissions de gaz à effet de serre direct et hermétique, y compris avec les utilisations foncières si on utilise les capacités des personnes affectées par les événements climatiques, les sécheresses, les inondations, euh, les incendies, les feux, si l'investissement contribue à l'atténuation, à l'adaptation au changement climatique et si l'investissement utilise à bon escient les ressources finies, notamment les ressources en terre, en eau et d'autres ressources menacées par le changement climatique. Il est donc important de rassembler les informations de la part des investisseurs, des experts climatiques et écologiques et des informations de la part des peuples autochtones et des communautés locales 
quand on cherche à répondre à ces questions. Et peut, on, on peut à ce titre utiliser le processus d'autorisation des investissements. Ces processus se prend en compte euh, toutes les exigences légales nationales euh, pour que les investisseurs puissent recevoir une autorisation. Et cela passe d'un pré-examen du projet jusqu'aux négociations et la conclusion des contrats. Merci, Émilie. Cette réponse a été très claire. Nous allons revenir sur certains aspects plus détaillés de ce processus d'autorisation des investissements et quels sont les leviers qu'on peut actionner dans ce cadre-là en lien avec l'action climatique. Maintenant, j'aimerais examiner quelques contextes nationaux pour savoir qu'est-ce qui peut donner lieu à des mauvais alignements sur les ambitions climatiques. Dans le cadre de la Zambie, Isaac, est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler des difficultés auxquelles vous pouvez être confronté en Zambie en ce qui concerne les investissements fonciers en Zambie et en lien avec les ambitions climatiques. Merci beaucoup de me donner la, la parole. La Zambie peut être euh, considérée comme un bon exemple en ce qui concerne les paramètres clés évoqués par l'intervenante précédente. Dans le cadre de la Zambie, mais la répondre n'entend plus l'intervenant. Nous sommes euh, très dépendants du secteur minier. Cette dépendance sur l'extraction minière donne lieu à une situation où le nombre d'investissements miniers qui rentrent correspondent à un désir de la part du gouvernement zambien de dé délivrer des licences pour l'exploration dans certaines zones. Et nous constatons qu'il y a un conflit par rapport à certaines ambitions de protection environnementale, dans le sens où certaines activités d'exploration minière qui ont lieu sont des activités qui sont en contradiction avec d'autres aspects environnementaux. Euh, savoir la protection de l'environnement local. Je peux vous donner un exemple euh, euh, le lieu où je, je me trouve aujourd'hui. Nous suivons une affaire dans l'un des districts au nord-ouest de notre pays. Il s'agit euh, de l'une euh, des régions où nous travaillons sur les investissements fonciers à grande échelle. Nous euh, constatant que dans le but de faciliter l'arrivée des investissements euh, miniers, il y a une démarche cherchant à déplacer les habitants locaux, les transférer dans un autre lieu du pays et un, une grande conversation qui a lieu concernant les indemnités qui sont versées. D'autres choses qui se passent dans notre pays, et notamment dans la région centrale, c'est que pour préparer l'arrivée euh, des activités minières euh, en réponse à la transition énergétique. Il y a des zones très importantes qui commencent à être ouvertes pour l'extraction de, de minéraux tels que la manganèse. Ce sont des zones qui étaient auparavant des communautés euh, d'agriculteurs. Pour cette raison, nous constatons qu'il y a une masse, menace pesant sur la biodiversité de ces régions et il y a une menace pour l'environnement parce que que les activités minières ont lieu sont des activités d'extraction à mines ouvertes nécessitant d'abattre beaucoup d'arbres. Il y a donc une menace non seulement pour les communautés locales, mais il y a également une menace en ce qui concerne la sécurité alimentaire dans ces communautés. Je pourrais peut-être partager d'autres aspects de notre expérience un peu plus tard euh, liés au travail que nous menons en Zambie. Merci beaucoup. Beaucoup, Isaac. Peut-être un peu plus tard, nous allons entendre davantage parler du travail que vous menez afin de gérer ces différents défis. Vous avez cité ici quelques complexités et arbitrages qui peuvent exister dans le, la gouvernance des investissements et notamment les différentes externalités et les contradictions liées à la transition énergétique, notamment dans le contexte zambien où les impacts climatiques sont ressentis de manière aiguë mais qu'il y a euh, des impacts de ces investissements en ce qui concerne les efforts d'atténuation et d'adaptation des effets du changement climatique. Nous allons céder la parole maintenant à Olivier. Est-ce que vous pourrez nous expliquer les différentes contradictions qui peuvent exister dans le contexte sud-africain 
Et sur la base de votre expérience, est-ce que vous pouvez parler des différents leviers en ce qui concerne les politiques et les lois qui peuvent être votées dans ce contexte Merci, Olivier. L'intervenante n'a pas activé son microphone. Olivia, si vous pouvez activer votre microphone. Merci. Je m'en excuse. L'Afrique du Sud est un exemple intéressant parce qu'il s'agit d'un pays en développement avec un niveau assez élevé d'émissions. Nous avons un profil assez intensif en termes de carbone. Nous avons euh, une source euh, qui est la source la plus importante d'émissions euh, de gaz à effet de serre, mais nous avons en même temps ce triple défi du chômage euh, qui va gal galopant des niveaux très élevés de pauvreté et d'inégalité dans le pays. Et à côté de cela, euh, notre ministre des Affaires environnementales dit que nous avons des objectifs relativement ambitieux en réduction des gaz à effet de serre. D'autres pays peuvent penser peut-être que ce n'est pas très ambitieux euh, dans le cadre de notre nos contributions déterminées au niveau national. Nous sommes un pays euh, très dépendant aux énergies fossiles. Nous avons beaucoup de ressources en, en, en charbon. Nous avons beaucoup de centrales euh, qui brûlent du charbon et euh, notre euh, secteur minière euh, représente une partie importante de notre économie. Nous reconnaissons néanmoins qu'il est nécessaire de vivre une transition énergétique et nous avons co connu beaucoup de, de, de coupures de l'électricité c'est notamment lié à un défaut de maintenance euh, des financements qui manquent et euh, une mauvaise gouvernance du secteur énergétique. Nous espérions que le partenariat entre l'Afrique du Sud, l'Union européenne, l'Allemagne la, euh, et le Royaume-Uni qui a été conclu à la COP26 pourrait révolutionner le secteur. 9,3 milliard, euh, milliards de dollars a été consacré à la décarbonisation des centrales euh, existantes. Nous espérions que ce, cette initiative allait amener des investissements du secteur privé parce que le besoin en financement était bien au-delà des 9,3 milliards. Mais il, était très, il a été très difficile de finaliser ces plans d'investissement. Un problème consiste en un manque de certitude politique. Il y a eu des revirements en ce qui concerne les ambitions en termes d'objectifs de, 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 de réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. On ne sait pas si certaines centrales à charbon vont être démantelées, déclassées ou pas, mais... Euh, L'accord a été difficile à accepter, euh, certaines conditions, certaines clauses euh, coûtent cher. Une grande partie euh, de, de ce financement euh, est proposée sous forme de crédit et, et le pays est déjà fortement endetté. Il y a beaucoup d'incertitudes également en ce qui concerne euh, notre ministère des Affaires euh, en, euh, environnementales. Différentes publications ont été faites, mais... La capacité à réaliser les contributions déterminées au niveau national, étant donné des aspirations de, du pays pour élargir le réseau de gaz de ville et le désir de maintenir en activité les centrales à charbon, pose des questions concernant la réalisation de ces objectifs dans le cadre des CDN. On se pose la question de savoir si ces objectifs sont tenables. Plus récemment, le Parlement sud-africain a voté euh, l'adoption de la loi sur le changement climatique. On attend sa signature. Une fois euh, pour projet, on va euh, s'engager en faveur des objectifs. Et cela va également euh, inciter le ministère des Affaires environnementales à publier des euh, données sectorielles. Ces objectifs vont obliger certains secteurs, le transport ou l'industrie, à atteindre entre euh, certains objectifs. Le ministère peut choisir les moyens afin de réaliser ces objectifs, mais les plans et les stratégies doivent être modifiés afin de pouvoir accomplir ces objectifs. 
C'est une manière de pouvoir assurer que le secteur énergétique s'aligne sur les objectifs politiques en réduction des gaz à effet de serre. On ne sait pas si ce sera réaliste et atteignable dans la pratique. Cela dépendra de la volonté politique, mais pensant que c'est un exemple intéressant de la manière dont un pays en développement peut utiliser la législation pour atteindre l'alignement avec les ambitions climatiques et favoriser la transition verte. Merci beaucoup, Olivia. Cela permet de dresser un cadre, mais nous permet également de, de réfléchir aux leviers politiques et législatifs qui peuvent être actionnés dans le cadre de ce processus. Vous avez également souligné certaines contraintes, certaines limites et, et, et les questions très importantes qui sont liées en matière de volonté politique. Uh, I want to just come back to where we started with Grace on the investment approval processes. So if you've got the broad policy and legal frameworks governing investment and, and climate, um, but it, when we get to a, a, an individual um, investment, what happens and what are the steps within that that we might look to? Um, so I wonder if you could elaborate a little more, Grace, for us on the, the investment assessment processes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the investment assessment process is the second step in the broader investment life cycle, which begins with creating an enabling environment for investments through policy and regulations. So like the climate change bill that um, Olivia was just speaking to and concludes with investment closure. The IAP specifically includes substages of investment screening, consultation with project affected groups, environmental and social impact assessments, which Lorenzo will speak to more further, and negotiations and contracting with investors. Uh, in CCSI's guidance for national and local governments on incorporating climate considerations into investment assessment processes, we speak to all these stages in depth. Um, and I'll share a link to that guidance in the chat. But for now, I'll just speak briefly to the first two steps, which are investor screening and consultations. So when an investor approaches a host government to invest in their country, these governments can and should ideally screen these proposed investments for approval, conditional approval, or rejection uh, with attention to climate risk to and from an investment, uh, which I elaborated on earlier. Uh, so there are models and tools available to project developments and governments through which uh, they can assess these risks to and from an investment. And many of these are listed in the appendix of the guidance, which I mentioned. And these models and tools can be used to uh, estimate a project's life cycle greenhouse gas emissions and its climate adaptation scenarios. So for instance, if a government was screening a forestry project, it would involve assessing the greenhouse gas emissions ecological risks and livelihood threats to traditional forest dwellers from deforestation alongside the projected drought, forest fire, and or flood risks to the forestry project, uh, which could be determined by consulting climate models for the project area. So now onto the second stage consultations. So governments investors should publicly consult with project affected groups as early as possible in the investment assessment process. So ideally right after the investment is approved or even earlier if possible and relevant. Uh, this will allow ample time for project affected community members to provide their feedback on the project and influence project design. Uh, and these consultations are really essential to also respect the distinct tenure resource environmental and human rights of indigenous peoples and marginalized local communities. Uh, it's important to note that these rights are unique to different identity groups who may be impacted by the project. So for instance, the right to free prior and informed consent, FPIC, is unique to Indigenous peoples and must be carried out with project-affected Indigenous peoples to abide by international law. Though it's also an emerging best practice to carry out FPIC processes with non-Indigenous marginalized local communities. This is in part because governments and project developers are realizing um, that when FPIC is obtained and maintained throughout the project life cycle, investments are more durable, sustainable, and successful 
as these epic processes uh, really help to build trust across project affected groups, governments, and investors. Thanks, Grace. That that's helpful, and that gets us into to the real detail and um, scrutinizing uh, investments and uh, the extent to which they respond to local uh, contexts, needs, uh, and indeed rights and environmental management concerns. Uh, you already handed over to Lorenzo uh, in a in a way, and that specifically we wanted to go a little bit deeper on the impact assessment component of, of um, assessment processes. So, Lorenzo, I wonder if you could take us through a little bit about what you see ESIAs or EIAs offering us in terms of a governance tool for this aligning process. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Emily and uh, Grace, as already uh, discussed, the importance of uh, investment approval processes as a lever uh, for aligning investment with climate action. And I think uh, environmental and social uh, impact assessments are particularly relevant in our mapping of relevant uh, policy instruments because they are key mechanisms through which the environment and climate change can be considered in investment approval processes. Um, and it's worth remembering that land-based investments can have significant impacts both on climate mitigation and adaptation, as Grace mentioned earlier, and these impacts can be both direct and indirect. Uh, direct, for example, because the clearing of a forest for the project uh, can it release greenhouse gas emissions and also destroys uh, a carbon sink. Uh, but also indirect because the overall climate impacts arise not only from the project itself, but also from activities that the project makes possible. So, for example, if you have a new coal mine, there are often climate uh, concerns, not only because of the emissions that originate from its construction and operation, but also because the coal will ultimately be sold and burned uh, to generate uh, power, uh, even if in distant places. And in, in the technical uh, jargon, this type of downstream, indirect downstream emissions are referred to as scope three emissions. Now, in practice, there are recurring challenges that undermine the effectiveness of uh, impact assessments in many contexts. There can be potential conflicts of interest, limited review by the regulatory authorities, and one key challenge here is that impact assessments often focus on the local impacts more than the climate impacts of projects and even more so of downstream activities. And uh, to make uh, environmental and social impact assessments a more powerful tool uh, for climate action, there needs to be a more integrated approach to properly assessing climate impacts, direct and indirect. And of course, there are major complexities at play, particularly when it comes to properly factory, factoring in the downstream impacts. Uh, but there have also been evolutions uh, in this direction. Uh, for one, uh, climate data and methodologies uh, are increasingly reliable, uh, which means that this type of analysis is more feasible. But also in several countries, national courts have issued decisions that really require impact assessments to consider downstream greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, so that these legal cases really highlight the role of uh, advocates and activists, as well as courts, in ensuring that impact assessment properly uh, address climate change. But ultimately, there's a role, a key role for governments in enacting clearer regulations that more explicitly integrate climate impacts and climate dimensions in environmental uh, assessment uh, processes, and also that more effectively integrate climate considerations in the practice of ESIAs and also more generally uh, investment approval processes. Wonderful. Thank you, Lorenzo. And I think you set out clearly the some of the challenges um, in the context of, of ESIAs, but also some of the, the best practice that we can now move towards uh, and that there are steps in this direction. Um, so I wanted to now bring in Dr. Ayele. Um, because Ethiopia has a new ESI regulation. And I wonder if you could just talk us through the ways this is more climate aligned than um, previously uh, and the significance and, and limitations of the new legislation um, following from some of Lorenzo's comments. Thanks, Ayeli. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ethiopia first, um, it was adopted the first uh, environmental impact assessment in 2002. That was at a time when uh, most of us uh, would not really 
understand at the level uh, currently we understand climate change uh, impact and uh, related issues. Um, last three, four years, starting 2018, we were uh, reviewing uh, Ethiopian environmental impact assessment legal framework, uh, having a comparative jurisdiction from different uh, countries and also looking at uh, the context in Ethiopia, uh, the challenge and dynamism going on um, in uh, environmental impact and social impact and also biodiversity impact, including climate climate uh, system protection. So having, uh, uh, looking at source uh, dynamism going on uh, at local and uh, international level, we develop legal framework uh, that was adopted uh, before uh, two weeks, uh, environmental impact, environmental and social impact assessment. So the, the, the previous one was environmental impact assessment uh, and uh, focusing on environmental sustainability um, and economic growth. Um, the current one is uh, clearly looking at environmental, social, and also at the same time looking at economic growth. So it is something balanced uh, when we look at the components included uh, in the new legal framework and uh, so many key features advancing uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation component uh, when uh, assessment uh, uh, conducted by professionals and also reviewing uh, conducted by uh, environmental regulators to take into account um, uh, those very important uh, climate change and also those impact majorly uh, from projects, uh, investment projects, and also government uh, uh, public instrument like uh, policies, uh, programs, uh, legislations, uh, potentially impacting or affecting um, on, on the on the on the on the uh, way uh, uh, this uh, misalignment and, and climate change issues. So uh, that that is really from from Ethiopian perspective it is comprehensive when you look at. The public participation, the previously the public participation is not clearly uh, provided in the in the environmental impact assessment regulation. The community participating is really nominal uh, in practice, and uh, the problem actually the legal framework compressiveness, compressiveness itself because the state in, in which stage are the local local community going to participated and also how their, their, their participation, their voice is really accounted um, in the process. So that is a clear challenge. So we changed those important um, aspects, understood this, those important aspects because the project potentially affect the communities uh, in the investment projects, also those uh, in, um, public instruments. And uh, we also advanced in the area of uh, Licensing process, licensing uh, the, the trade license, investment license um, uh, needs in advance um, environmental and social clearance, uh, especially for for the uh, license updating and renewal process. Um, actually, needs uh, environmental and social clearance uh, from uh, environmental regulators from federal and regional level. So that is the new um, really. Uh, uh, improvement and advancement in, in Ethiopian new legislation. Further, um, we we brought some improvement in the area of environmental auditing. Uh, so yearly basis, um, the investors expected uh, to conduct self-assessment, self-audits within themselves, and also regulatory institutions, uh, independent assessment within uh, Two years interval, so that follow up uh, would uh, really advance reactive measures and competence and enforcement from uh, a regulatory framework. Uh, so uh, those are really major new uh, advancement uh, in the in the legislation. What I observe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yele. That's uh, clearly a, a step forwards uh, and really interesting to hear the details of that and the, the encompassing nature of the new regulation. 
Um, whilst you've mentioned a few other mechanisms, I wonder if you would like to just take us through a few other areas um, that illustrate uh, the kind of policy levers um, that are trying to govern this disconnect between um, between investment promotion and and climate. Um, some of the the overarching frameworks um, that are in place in Ethiopia. The, the major disconnect, what I observe, um, not only in Ethiopia, in uh, many developing countries. Um, uh, as you know, the Ethiopian NDC and um, CRG, Climate Resilient, Resilient Green Economic Strategy, uh, what you see, sectoral caps is it. So it is sectorally fit, uh, for instance, agriculture, agriculture expected to um, mitigate uh, defined uh, crop of uh, greenhouse gas and uh, industry construction and um, uh, those defined sectors um, expected to minimize greenhouse gas uh, emission and also uh, um, build uh, resilience uh, for that specific um, uh, sector. The challenge now, what I observe, um, not only just uh, coming with framework, legal framework uh, for environmental impact, environmental and social impact assessment. So the cap, without having well-defined cap for the companies uh, at grass grassroots level, I think that that is clear challenge uh, because at the end implementation mitigation measures uh, for for greenhouse gases actually uh, depend on, on on companies level engagement. So. Uh, without having clear caps uh, for uh, each companies uh, through, it might be cap and trace system. Uh, some countries using uh, such system because it is very important uh, for, for um, economic, um, to, to advance uh, climate actions through economic instrument uh, than that of uh, command and control uh, per se approach. So that is what I see as um, uh, disconnect and also but the, the, the challenge of um, uh, means of implementation, in particular the, the, the finance needed. Uh, if you look at Ethiopian NDC, uh, um, the, the updated one, 2021, it requires 80% finance to come from uh, somewhere else, uh, those uh, obligated by Paris Agreement developed countries and uh, countries in position to do so, and also uh, some partners to bring resources. Uh, so, 20% uh, upfront Ethiopian government from public sources going to uh, mobilize for the implementation for the climate action. Um, uh, despite the fact that Ethiopian government recently, uh, I think this year, just within this uh, last week, um, uh, the new forest legislation coming, uh, the, the government um, to uh, to mobilize one to five percent of uh, a yearly budget for uh, afforestation and reforestation uh, action. Uh, that is major intervention from government side. Uh, that might not really address and uh, really adequate enough to 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 take uh, all uh, climate action uh, featured in NDC. So the disconnect is really. Uh, the, the, the legal framework cap disconnect what you can see uh, and also the resource uh, from uh, those mobilized resources mobilized from uh, different sources and also in some cases also you may see technical gaps so uh, it be environmental impact assessment on so many environmental and the climate action it needs uh, technical capacity in so many ways so those are uh, disconnected uh, practically, practically continue to affect um, realization of uh, climate action, it be mitigation or adaptation. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've you've helpfully taken us through the different levels of engagement as well as brought in the critical question of, of finance, which I'm sure we will come back to in, in a number of ways as well. I want to swiftly move us on and take us back to the Zambia context and ask Isaac if you might also flag some of these kind of national level um, 
initiatives and frameworks that are, are grappling with the, the context that you described earlier and some of the um, the environmental management context that we've we've heard about. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, I think in the Zambian context, uh, in terms of uh, strengths, I should make mention uh, that one of them would be the fact that we do have uh, uh, a guiding framework uh, in terms of uh, a policy that is speaking to how we would want to conduct affairs within the uh, environment space, and that is the climate uh, uh, change uh, policy. But besides that, uh, there has been a process to try and develop uh, a climate uh, a change uh, bill, uh, which has reached some advanced uh, stage. And currently, there are some consultations that are going on with regards to that. There are also other sectors that uh, speak to some of these challenges that we are faced with, uh, such as uh, the mining sector, where we have a lot of uh, large scale uh, investments. So within the mining sector, there have been a number of reforms that the government has been undertaking. And part of those reforms are speaking to how uh, we are planning to uh, ensure that there is effective regulation of investors. So the government is in the process of trying to set up what they are calling a mines and minerals uh, regulation commission. Uh, this is a process that has uh, reached an advanced stage. It has also been tabled. Uh, before Parliament in terms of uh, that proposal, debates have happened within Parliament and now we are waiting for Cabinet to approve that. Other than that, uh, there is equally another ministry that has been working around developing a green growth uh, uh, strategy and this is a process that was uh, done more recently. It was officially finalised and launched a process through which we had contributed in terms of uh, getting to review that. The downside in terms of weakness is uh, that uh, uh, having some of these documents is one thing, but the implementation is where it is more problematic. Uh, you find that when you look at uh, key instruments such as the national budget, you find that uh, public resources that are invested towards actualizing some of the commitments uh, within some of these regulations is quite problematic. And uh, in terms of implementation, we also see an over-reliance in terms of uh, external uh, funding support to actualize some of the plans. On the international level, there are equally uh, conversations that we've been looking at more recently, and some of those are speaking to issues related to bilateral investment uh, treaties, and looking at some of the limitations uh, that uh, these uh, bring, uh, especially the fact that uh, within some of these international agreements, you would have specific provisions that speak to how disputes related to investments are supposed to be done. And uh, even if in the current setup, we do not have uh, uh, specific cases uh, that we can point at uh, that are related to disputes that the Zambian government uh, has, uh, but we do think that it is very important that we equally begin to interrogate uh, specific provisions that are contained in uh, international uh, investment agreements like bilateral investment treaties, as well as other provisions that might be contained even in double taxation agreements uh, that we tend to sign to facilitate investments. On the other hand, it's also issues related to sensitization and consultation of uh, strategic stakeholders that can provide input, especially those that get to be affected uh, by uh, some of these uh, challenges that we have been uh, discussing within these platforms. So it would be very important that uh, we equally take uh, such into consideration if we are to ensure that uh, uh, there is also demand from the target beneficiaries on some of these uh, regulations that we have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, and that talks to some of the processes that's, that Grace was alluding to as well. Um, but I'd like to pick up the point about uh, the international investment frameworks um, that may be shaping investment governance at the national level. So taking us to uh, international frameworks discussion, um, Lorenzo, um, how relevant are these and to this discussion about aligning investment with climate change ambitions? 
Yes, thank you very much, Emily. And um, and uh, uh, it's an important question, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, Isaac has already mentioned some of the reasons why that is the case. Um, in that investment governance is shaped not just by national policy, but also by international frameworks. And there is just now a growing reflection on ways to realign international investment treaties, in particular with climate action. Uh, these treaties typically protect foreign investment and enable foreign investors to bring disputes with the state uh, to an international arbitration system that is known as ISDS, uh, Investor State Dispute uh, Settlement. Um, and there are currently over 2,600 investment protection treaties uh, in force worldwide, uh, mainly bilateral uh, and some uh, regional as well. And there have been uh, well over 1,300 known uh, arbitrations uh, based on these treaties. Um, the way it works uh, is that if the investor wins, uh, the arbitral tribunal would typically award damages, and this can involve very large amounts. Um, now, the rationale for the system was that the legal protections would help promote investment, even though in practice, the empirical evidence of whether this works is mixed and, and inconclusive. But from a climate perspective, from a policy perspective, it's important that arrangements that are designed to promote investments are aligned with climate goals. And looking at Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement, uh, for example, uh, it calls for uh, making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. Uh, so very much about aligning the investment flows with climate goals. Uh, but if you look at most investment treaties, these were concluded long before the Paris Agreement, and they protect all covered investments without differentiating between high or low carbon activities. And in fact, the fossil fuel industry has been a major user of this system historically. Uh, in addition, most of these investment treaties set high standards of investment protection, uh, partly as a result of the ways in which they've been interpreted by arbitral tribunals. So what does this mean in practice? Well, for example, if in the context of the energy transition or climate action, states were to restrict or phase out fossil fuels, or whether, or if, for example, they were to take action to more explicitly factor climate considerations in environmental impact assessments, for example, as we were discussing earlier, that they may face uh, arbitration claims for businesses that are seeking large amounts of damages. And this uh, can increase the costs of climate action, but also the IPCC noted that this can make it more difficult for governments to take action in the first place, um, uh, with climate measures being shelved or delayed in full or in part. Now, there are ongoing talks uh, at the UN, at the OECD, uh, in other fora on ways to reform the system. And I think it seems helpful for a holistic conversation about aligning investment governance with, with climate action to also consider these uh, important international dimensions as well. Thank you, Lorenzo. I wonder, whilst we're on this, whether you might elaborate a little more on concretely what this might mean in practice, considering these international aspects that you've mentioned? Yes, I think sort of aligning investment treaties with climate considerations uh, would require exploring a number of questions, uh, and it's perhaps a longer conversation uh, than is possible just now. But there are in first questions about policy objectives. So what is the aim of concluding a treaty? How does that uh, treaty help advance climate action, and thinking through such questions can help uh, more explicitly frame the treaty around policy objectives that are explicitly tied to climate action and just, just energy transition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are also questions about uh, the types of investments to promote and regulate in pursuit of those policy objectives. Um, for example, we treat is more explicitly differentiating between climate harmful and climate friendly investments, right? Making that distinction more explicit, uh, including in the ways in which the, 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 the coverage of the treaty operates. 
third, there are a number of questions about some of the uh, substantive provisions that are often found in investment treaties, particularly with regards to the investment protection standards, which, as I mentioned, are uh, set at a high at a high level. And there are questions as to whether they actually help uh, in promoting investments. And there are questions about how uh, can governments, how can states most effectively safeguard the, the right and duty to regulate in the public interest, including for climate uh, and so on. And then finally, there are a number of questions that relate to the terms of investment, as it were, uh, from how to ensure compliance with rigorous social and environmental standards, all the way to uh, facilitating access to technologies that will be needed for the low carbon transition, for example. Thank you, Lorenzo. And yes, I appreciate we're dealing with quite complex, weighty subjects in a whistle-stop tour uh, in this session, but hopefully more opportunities to, to dive deeper. Um, whilst we're talking about international frameworks and mechanisms, I wonder if, Olivia, I can bring you back in uh, to give some thoughts from your experience and perspectives on areas that we really need to uh, focus in on that are or could be being used to strengthen this process of, of climate alignment, recognizing equity considerations at the global level um, that also might shel help shift um, trajectories at the at the national and, and local level. Thank you. Yeah, such an interesting and such a big question. Um, I was thinking about it quite a lot and, and, and a lot of the work that I do focuses particularly on adaptation and how do we channel investment and finance into adaptation and resilience projects. And, you know, in addition to um, some of the points that Lorenzo made about investment treaties and, and the international framework, um, th there's a lot of richness that comes out of the Paris Agreement that we're still trying to unpick um, when it comes to adaptation. And, you know, there's these broad phrases around, you know, obliging countries to um understand their vulnerabilities and to prioritize adaptation actions. And, and the NDC is obviously a really important vehicle for crystallizing what those actions are. Um, but in my own work, I'm seeing countries develop these NDCs, but then kind of placing them on the back burner and their other policies are then updated or, or evolve over time and the NDCs become updated or countries just don't have the finance to keep their NDCs up to date. And um, what I see them doing is is to develop national laws. Um, Zambia is a good example. I'm quite curious, um, Isaac, to, to understand what the Zambian law looks like a little bit um, in the discussion, but um, where they mandate national governments to first understand their vulnerabilities, so develop a, um, a national adaptation plan that assesses impacts and vulnerabilities, and that then comes up with adaptation responses. Um, and, and what's really interesting to see is that countries are doing that and they're using law as a vehicle to require that these plans are, they're not static, so that they're regularly revisited, so that the information remains live and relevant, but also that the actions become um, continuously relevant and updated so that they align with whatever the national uh, development strategy happens to be at that time. And, and what's so interesting to also see, and, and I've seen this a lot um, in the African continent, is um, the development of what we call adaptation investment frameworks. Um, the JETP example I gave you of South Africa was a mitigation, I suppose, focused one where a country develops a plan that says, this is our prioritized action, but this is some of the nuance behind it. These are the actors that we need to execute this action. This is how much finance we need for it. This is the nature of the finance um, that is required. And it really impacts it. So it's almost like a blue book to attract investors into those key prioritized projects that the government feels are particularly important. So yes, you have your NDC, but you have this investment framework operating alongside it. And it's and it's kind of structured neatly within the overall climate change legislation that mandates um, the review and the regular updating and alignment of these um, vulnerabilities, actions, and prioritized projects. Um, I, I'm aware we're a bit sensitive to time, so I, I won't talk about the carbon market at all. But if anyone's curious about that element, I'm also quite interested in how Article 6 is being used internationally to also drive investment in certain projects that otherwise wouldn't attract finance. Thank you, Olivia. Yes. And again, 
many rich conversations that are very urgent and very critical that uh, we can also continue in in other spaces and places. Uh, I think what you raise that was extremely helpful, the kind of processes for generating bottom-up investment strategies uh, rather than relying on um, shifting business as, as usual. Um, but the, the carbon discussion is important. And I think we to, already in the discussion have raised critical considerations around land and resource rights in the, in the context of climate-related investment. So rather than talking narrowly about um, realigning investment uh, with climate, uh, we need to talk about it in terms of, uh, in, a, in a holistic way that engages with the, the problems associated with um, uh, investments that are related to, to climate and carbon emissions. So we've heard about uh, critical mineral extraction in uh, Zambia in particular, um, but also more widely, we've heard about carbon and, and renewables, um, and, and they all go through these investment uh, assessment processes in different ways, shapes and forms. Um, so we do need to focus in on that. And I wonder, as we move towards the this final part of the discussion, Grace, if I could bring you back in to, to elaborate on that a little bit about why and how we need to be considering these critical tenure resource, resource tenure rights um, at the same time as this climate alignment discussion uh, and to have a holistic um, vision going forwards. Yeah, so human rights abuses are unfortunately a problem with renewable energy and critical minerals investments, uh, as we heard about earlier in the examples Isaac shared of local food security concerns in the context of critical minerals mining in Zambia. So scaling out, according to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, there are over 200 allegations of adverse human rights impacts linked to renewable energy projects uh, recorded between 2010 and 2020, and nearly 500 of similar abuses linked to mining for critical minerals from 2010 to 2021. Uh, I'm going to focus on the why. In the interest of time, we should consider human rights. Um, and this is essential uh, to the energy transition and mitigating climate change for three critical reasons. Uh, so importantly, these are immoral and unjust attacks on marginalized communities who are often indigenous peoples and in vulnerable local communities, uh, who also oftentimes serve as local land stewards. This means that they help maintain biodiversity and ecosystem well-being, which is critical to climate mitigation and adaptation. Secondly, irresponsible renewable energy projects uh, can cascade and have cascaded in a number of cases into conflict and protest, which can cause project delays and even project cancellation. This ends up slowing the energy transition, uh, results in costly legal fees and reputational damage for renewable energy investors as well. Finally, respecting human rights and protecting the environment go hand in hand. Uh, so when companies respect local communities' resource rights to clean water access, they'll also have to ensure that they're not polluting bodies of water from their operations. So for instance, if a mining company wants to respect local communities' right to water, then they're going to have to make sure that uh, there's no toxic runoff from their operations entering local waterways, which in turn benefits the environment. Uh, in terms of the how stakeholders, various stakeholders uh, can make an effort to protect human rights in the energy transition, CCSI has a number of resources with concrete and actionable recommendations, which I'll drop in the chat. Thank you, Grace. And yes, please do share resources that might be of interest um, so that people can go deeper and also look at the, the nuts and bolts of some of these strategies and approaches. Um, Dr. Ayeli, I'd like to bring you back in to, for some reflections on the kind of laws and policy levers that relate to this more holistic approach to advancing land-based investment governance um, from your experiences and possibly specific to, to Ethiopia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emily, again. Um, uh, as, as, um, I raised uh, um, in Ethiopia, um, we have so many legal frameworks and uh, strategies that uh, uh, address climate change 
uh, action uh, across the sectors. Um, I think one of one of uh, holistic approach. What uh, what we we can find is uh, the environmental impact assessment itself because it is it affects everything um, across the sectors and also considers holistically uh, environmental, social, and economic development uh, related issues, including climate change and um, uh, the. the Climate resilient green economic strategy also very holistic uh, by its nature uh, because it, 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 it consider every every aspect um, also the national uh, income country uh, through economic growth uh, and um, the updated NDC also fully comprehensive if we look at uh, the nature of uh, uh, the, 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 the NDC uh, submitted for UNFCC. Um, recently, we we are uh, engaging. Uh, if you look at the, the, the uh, land related uh, uh, investment and also uh, activities are major um, a contributor for greenhouse gas emission and also responding for uh, resilient uh, resilience building. So from that perspective. Uh, um, Recently, uh, Ethiopian government adopted uh, the, the, the special fund for for the for the for the country um, uh, how to respond um, the, 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 the degradation and also deforestation challenge through independent uh, funding scheme. So um, that that is really very important um, uh, uh, legal and policy tools. At the same time, we are now developing one important legal framework ecosystem service uh, payment proclamation. Uh, it is at, now at final stage. Um, it is also uh, fully understanding what's happening in the ecosystem across uh, uh, different uh, ecosystems and land uh, resources and uh, uh, bringing resources, uh, generating fund uh, innovatively from, from uh, those benefiting ecosystems and also uh, those uh, contributing toward uh, maintaining the ecosystem. So those are um, areas uh, I see uh, some uh, really um, opportunities uh, and also prospects um, um, unlock uh, what's happening in in uh, in in the area of uh, climate action because of uh, means of implementation and overall uh, uh, legal framework implementation. Thank you very much. And, and before I ask all of you just to come back with some kind of forward looking pointers, does any, do any other of the panelists want to come in on this? Um, question of, of mechanisms, levers that really help us with the more integrated, holistic approach, particularly in the context of um, uh, the impacts of climate-related investments. So looking at the just, uh, through the framing of just transition or other, um, looking at some of these uh, challenging processes to manage rights and resources uh, close to the ground. But uh, added to what Dr. Ayele has uh, ably shared is the need for uh, countries that uh, are, are grappling with uh, these challenges to equally consider uh, coming up with uh, more coordinated uh, uh, platforms uh, from within their countries. Uh, in terms of the coordination, uh, we'll be looking at coordination at uh, interministerial level because part of what we're observing as a big challenge in the Zambian uh, context is uh, a situation where uh, some of the laws that exist in various ministries, uh, laws that are not speaking to each other, and we also see that uh, there are also challenges related to how key ministries that are responsible for uh, managing some of those laws not having close collaboration to an extent that as they formulate additional regulations or laws, they get to ensure that. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, a process of cross-checking how potentially some of those regulations are impacting negatively. Uh, for instance, in our case, we have the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry 
of, of uh, commerce, the ministry that is in charge of mines, you find that most of the regulations that uh, they would formulate are in conflict with some of the provisions that are speaking or sitting with other ministries that are responsible for managing our forests. So it would be very important that uh, there is also improved interministerial coordination as they formulate regulations and uh, implement those uh, in a coherent manner. Thank you, Isaac. And I think you do raise a, a very important issue for, for all contexts to be thinking through how the, the coordination and, and uh, between different sectors and different ministries. Um, before we jump to a couple of questions, uh, I'd like to ask all of the panelists in turn to um, try and share a, a top priority or key takeaway for those who are working in this space on climate law, just transition strategies, and those engaged more in more de narrowly defined investment arenas. Um, to focus on the types of governance levers that we can really work with. Um, I realize we've covered a lot of ground in a very short space of time, so and this is not an easy task, but uh, if I go through in turn, let's see what we have on the table, then we'll have a few questions, and then hopefully we can continue the chat beyond today. Um, so, Grace, I wonder if you could kick us off with your top forward-looking comment. Yeah, so my top comment would be that governments have the opportunity to institute investment assessment processes, which incentivize, facilitate, and regulate investments to ensure they respect human rights, support social and ecological well-being, and mitigate or adapt to rather than exacerbate the climate crisis. And this is acknowledging the challenges with financing that um, other speakers have mentioned. Thank you. Now to Isaac, if you'd like to share a thought. Well, it would be very important for governments that they uh, take advantage of uh, opportunities that might come uh, with developments such as the energy transition. But we equally do get to undertake cost benefit analysis on some of these investment opportunities so that ultimately it's not just a process of wanting to attract investments into a particular sector, but we should have the long-term thinking in terms of the potential implications that some of the investments might have on people, the environment, as well as uh, in general, uh, the benefits that a country would uh, derive from such investments if we were to prioritize alternative uh, options, uh, say, in, in place of mining, what would be the alternative? Would agriculture be that best alternative? Uh, would uh, promoting tourism uh, be the best alternative? And if it's so, uh, of the three options or four options, we are looking at which one takes a holistic uh, approach in terms of protecting the environment, people, and ultimately promoting sustainable development. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, over to Olivia. I wonder if you would like to share. Um, yeah, I work with a lot of countries who are keen to develop climate change laws, but don't really know where to start. And I think there's a lack of appreciation that, you know, these laws can serve wonderful domestic objectives. You know, um, as Isaac was pointing out there, you can achieve a lot of policy coherence and institutional alignment with them. But they're also increasingly becoming a very important instrument for investors looking to invest in specific sectors of an economy. Um, and I think that's an underappreciated element of these laws. And whilst there's a lot of merit in building on examples that other countries have done, not necessarily just copying and pasting the laws, but sort of drawing on best practices that you might find in other countries, um, I think if these laws are to be really, really useful, they, they really need to speak to the local um, governance and related institutional challenges that might be hindering or um, disincentivizing investment. And, and if a country can do that, they can not only achieve a lot more coherence in how they manage uh, their domestic climate response, but they can crowd in private sector investment um, in, in quite a significant way. Thank you very much. 
And Dr. Ayele, can I invite you to share your thoughts? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think from my, my perspective, understanding um, country driven gaps, uh, existing gap in climate uh, governance and uh, continuously reviewing gaps and uh, continuously developing uh, policies, policies and legal framework uh, for, for bridging existing gaps and also um, ensuring implementation and confidence uh, enforcement really very important. Uh, for that, actually, it needs uh, resources, needs of implementation. Uh, it, actually, resources need to come from uh, different uh, scales uh, from international level and also local level, national level. So um, contributing toward everyone uh, shoulder to shoulder to, to implement those developed legal framework and also uh, this type of uh, technical uh, cooperation working together with technical experts uh, from different corner of the world. Really very important uh, to understand and also share experiences and also skills. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're covering a lot of ground across these comments, so there's plenty of food for thought. Um, so before we come to a final comment from Lorenzo, I wanted to flag that there are a few resources being shared in the chat, uh, covering a whole range of points uh, on uh, investment assessment processes, but also on investment treaties uh, from the OECD. So please do take a moment to have a look at those um, and hope you find those useful. And uh, there's also a question, which I think because it's directed at Lorenzo, if that's all right, I'll integrate that now or raise that now and you can perhaps weave that into your, your final concluding comments. Um, so we have a, a question from David Allen. There's an excellent discussion on ESI frameworks, and I'm curious how gender, the gender focus will be incorporated into that as it is frequently a gap. Um, so a briefing note on this topic didn't have any references explicitly to gender, what type of gendered impact assessments might be planned as impacts are often likely to be larger on women and girls. So um, in addition to your final uh, forward-looking priorities, Lorenzo, I wonder if you could um, respond to that question as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Emily. And also just to add a further note to the resources shared in the chat, seem to be really a lot of very helpful resources. And in particular, in relation to the points I was speaking to, uh, resources that uh, colleagues from OECD have shared, and there are ongoing discussions at the OECD, really important work being done specifically on looking at investment treaties through the prism of climate and climate change. Um, coming to the question is a very important question about gender, um, because of course, land-based investments have uh, gendered impacts um, uh, affecting in a very different way uh, men and women, uh, among other categories of social differentiation. And uh, with regards to land-based investments, there is a significant literature that really documents this in research terms. Uh, and there's also a substantial body of practice among uh, uh, practitioners who are working to improve the practices of, of investment. And there are colleagues in the team who, have, who are very much focusing on that on that aspect, the sort of gender dimensions in, in investment processes. Um, I think it's really important, therefore, that impact assessments uh, do consider uh, gender uh, gender issues. Um, there are uh, multiple types of issues, but to illustrate, land-based investment typically involve uh, uh, impacts on land rights, and uh, women and men are often positioned very differently as regards to land. Uh, in many in many societies, uh, with uh, uh, very often women not only being more impacted by the projects, but also having less uh, opportunity uh, to actually shape decisions on on the project or the ways in which it deals with land land issues. So important that impact assessments consider this and other issues when it comes to um, uh, investment approval processes. And there are a number of aspects there from the very design of impact assessments, looking at how they are set up in the TORs, for example, ensuring that there is attention paid to gender disaggregated data, gender disaggregated analysis, gender expertise in the team that conducts the, uh, the, the, the assessment. 
um, the gender specific issues are, are considered also that are covered by the assessment. And also earlier there was discussion about the importance of consultation and sort of the, pu the public participation dimension of impact assessments. And of course, uh, the sort of be better practices often involve deliberate thinking on how to properly consider social differentiation, including based on gender, uh, so that different voices can be properly heard in the in the consultation process. So there is there's quite a bit that 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 uh, that can and should be done, um, and and that applies also to the uh, forward looking part, uh, the sort of the environmental and social management plans, and how to deal to deal with these issues in practice based on the findings of the impact assessment. Coming to the sort of overarching uh, reflections, uh, to me as a very general point, it strikes me as really, really helpful to uh, look at uh, investment governance in an integrated way, particularly when we consider climate and climate change. Um, so very often there are sort of somewhat siloed, fragmented discussions on different types of policy instruments that can have an influence on uh, the types of investment that are promoted and how and under what terms. And I think taking a a more integrated approach that looks across different instruments. So we've covered sort of international policy instruments, we've covered different aspects of legislation and policy from climate to investment, et cetera. But looking across all these can uh, first facilitating sort of uh, facilitate sharing of insights across different policy arenas on how best to integrate climate in, in, this, uh, uh, in, this, in this investment policies. Uh, but also avoid a situation where there are tensions between different with changes in different in, in policy spaces, right? So that advances in one area end up running into trouble because of other policy instruments that haven't quite followed through with the with the with the process of change. And and in that way, I think having this sort of holistic perspective can help us maximize the impact of policy reform when we look at that realigning uh, investment uh, governance with uh, with climate change. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, and I think you've you've brought together nicely the the discussion we've had today, um, and the fact that it is not the start or the end of a conversation. This is an ongoing process that we need to push forwards um, critically uh, and learning together about the different levers that work and uh, at the very detailed level and at the the macro level. Um, so I hope that has been useful. Um, and we've had a few other uh, chat comments in the chat and the, the Q&A reaching out for further exchange on the topics that we've raised today. Um, please do get in touch following this event um, and we can pick up those conversations uh, and see where uh, those exchanges can take us. It's very much in the spirit of London Climate Action Week to be making these connections. Um, and um i'm just checking one more question that may have come in um ah so we have an, a final final uh comment in the chat there um uh, before i wrap up i think we're at time um but uh, a comment there around uh greenwashing uh and the complexities of um the mining um uh, critical mineral extraction um, in the efforts to uh, mitigate climate change. So we're at time now, unfortunately. I'd like to just take a moment to thank all the panelists today, Grace, Lorenzo, Olivia, Dr. Yele, and Isaac. Um, and thank you all for your time and really look forward to continuing in the conversation. Um, with all of those of you who've attended, um, as well as the panelists. So thank you very much. Do get in touch and enjoy the rest of Climate Action Week.